Let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you all to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm your host, Cat Herder, and creator of the forum. I'm very glad to see you all here today. I'm looking forward to our conversation. But before we can begin, let me introduce you to the forum, uh, how it works, where it came from, how the technology works, and then we'll dive into this week's guest. So to begin with, the forum is a discussion-based platform. What I'm doing right now, of talking at you, I'm only going to do for a couple of minutes because the rest of this hour is going to be about peer-to-peer -peer conversation between all of you. So Tara, the next slide, please. Now, this forum is discussion-based and has spun out of a publication, uh, the regular Future Trends in Technology and Education Report, or FTTE. And that is a monthly trends analysis that looks at major trends reshaping education technology from across the world. And we've been doing this for about six years. Uh, it's right now uh, switched over to subscription-only publication strategy. So if you'd like to learn more, go to FTTE.us. We'd love it if you signed up. Uh, now, both of these together, the FTTE report and the Future Transform, are part of a broader project called the Future of Education Observatory. So Tara, over the next slide, please. That observatory is an ongoing multimedia, open, conversation-based attempt to try to understand the future of education. We have a lot of features in the observatory, including uh, a regular blog, which has all kinds of interesting ideas, an ongoing book club, which you'll learn about at the end of today's hour, uh, not to mention the FTD report, the forum, and more stuff still. So if you're curious, go to futureofeducation.us and you can learn more. Now, how does all this work happen? Who supports it? How can we make it keep going? Well, before I go further, I'd like to thank some of the sponsors who do make this work possible. So the first is NizerNet from New York State. Uh, that's a nonprofit that works with that state's universities and colleges and helps get them connected to broadband internet. We're really grateful to them for all their good work and especially for their support. Thank you. We're also grateful to Shindig because as you can tell, they make available the technology that we're using right now. So let me just take a minute to walk you through it. If you're new to the technology or if you haven't been here for a while. So first things first on the screen where I am and over here where the slide is, is called the stage. Now, that's so-called because everybody involved in this video conference can see and hear what goes on up here. Now, below us, you can see a whole bunch of different icons. Uh, some of them are people uh, who are looking at you through a video, like Brittany Ayo. Some of them are uh, static images. Uh, some of them are like uh, people in a room. Each of those represents a single sign-in. And if you'd like to have a private conversation with any of them, just double click on them. And if they want to have a conversation with you, your two icons will click together like Legos. You can have your own private audiovisual bubble. Now, that's the participant swarm, and you can see dozens of people there. Now, below them on the screen are the many options you have for interacting with a whole group. So let me show you the three biggies. There's a white strip running along the bottom of the screen that has a bunch of menu options. On the left edge, the first thing you'll see is what looks like a, a green box with a number on it. 56, 57, then uh, people's silhouettes and a little dialogue box. If you click that, up will pop two windows. Well, the window on the left will be a kind of film strip view of everybody who's here involved in this conversation. So if you'd like to learn more about them, you can just mouse over and learn more about who they are and where they come from. But to the right is our chat box. So that lets you chat, basic text chat, with the nearest 20 or so people who have signed on today with you. So you can say hello to all kinds of people. And we find the chat box is often used when people have to have informal conversation, tell jokes, but also if they want to share links to things that have come up, or if they want to try out some questions or comments uh, that they'd like to try in other ways. What are those other ways? Back to that white strip. You'll see next to the chat box button is a question mark with a circle around it. If you click that, you can quickly type in a comment or a question, which we can then flash to the screen for everyone to see, and I'll read it out loud so everyone can hear it. So that's a quick way to ask a question. Now next to that on the white strip, you'll see a raised hand button. If you click that, that tells us that you'd like to join us up here on stage. So if your microphone is working, and if your camera is working, and you're in a space like I am right now where you can speak out loud, click the raised hand button and we can just beam you up on stage. In fact, we can have two of you up on stage alongside myself and this week's guest. It's a kind of DIY pop-up panel. So it's easier, actually very, very easy to do. So you can use the hand for video, you can use a question mark for text, you can use a chat box for chat. Those are all ways to interact with each other and with the entire community. And on top of that, if you're running Twitter right now, just use the hashtag FTTE. 
and we'll be scanning Twitter for your thoughts and conversation. So again, the technology is all about conversation back and forth. It's all about discussion. And uh, we're very grateful to Shindig for making this technology available. We're also grateful to one other population, and that's our supporters on Patreon. Now, if you haven't seen Patreon, it's a crowdfunding site like uh, Kickstarter or GoFundMe, where the goal is to support someone making creative stuff. In that case, the stuff is the, our work about the future of education and technology. So right now, we have more than 100 people on Patreon who contribute as little as a dollar a month just to keep the lights on, the machines humming. Uh, if people contribute more than a dollar a month, they get extra good things. $10 a month, and they get uh, our monthly FTTE report. You can see from this graphic that we have all kinds of people who are uh, contributing. from Bob Johnson, Chris Lott, Jeannie Kim Han, a whole bunch of these great people. We're really grateful to them for their support. And we'd love you to join them if you haven't already. Just go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander to learn more. Thank you again to all our Patreon supporters. Now, that's how the forum works technologically. That's how it works financially. That's where it comes from. Let me just dive into this week's topic and guest then. We're really, really grateful to have Rich DeMillo back. Uh, Rich is the professor and director of the Center for 21st Century Universities. Uh, he is at Georgia Tech University. He has published multiple books on technology and education, uh, including uh, one that we discussed last year as one of our first guests. Now, this week, he's here to talk about their very innovative online Masters of Computer Science program one of the very few that actually is wholly online. It's a fascinating project done with all kinds of partners. Um, people have been asking for this for months and months and months. I'm grateful that Professor DeMillo has had the time to join us. So let's bring, let's put that slide away and let's bring Rich DeMillo up on stage, please. How are we doing now? Oh, we're doing beautifully. How are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. Good to see you. Oh, it's good to see you again. Rich, where are you today? Uh, I'm in my my really fancy conference room. <laughs> I, I detect a theme here of uh, it's not of, fancy. of white. Or green. Yeah. Well, welcome back. I'm really glad you had the time uh, to join us today. Can you, for those of for those few people here who haven't already seen you or read your work, can you just uh, quickly uh, give us a minute to say who you are, what you work on? So I'm a, a recovering uh, administrator at, at Georgia Tech. I was <laughs> the dean of the College of Computing. Georgia Tech um, is um, is a university that has um, an entire college devoted to information technology and computer computer science. Uh, it's uh, maybe the oldest of the colleges of computing, maybe wow. second, um, and um, uh, when I stepped down as, as dean, um, I, uh, I had become fascinated with educational technology and, and decided it would be really fun to set up a sandbox to be able to experiment with that. Mm. Um, that was 2008. And, and as we all know, the world kind of went to hell in a handbasket in 2008. Uh, and, um, and I found myself answering lots of questions that went well beyond educational technology. What's going on mm. with higher education, what's going on with institutions like, like Georgia Tech? And, um, and we became a kind of internal think tank, uh, first of all, for the university and then for the university system um, to, um, to kind of enable us to think um, 20 years out, uh, what, what might higher mm -hmm. education be, what might uh, the investments we make today um, in education look like to a student in the year 2040, let's say. And, and uh, our, our center is really focused on, on those kinds of disruptive, disruptive things. Uh, we've been really fortunate in, in getting um, um, private investment and in getting uh, philanthropic investment, university support to be able to put things in place that allow us to conduct the kinds of experiments we're gonna talk about today. Oh, excellent, excellent, thank you, thank you. Um, I didn't know you were one of the oldest computer science schools. That tells us a lot. Um, it, it's a it's a it's a um, it's a grudge match between Georgia Tech and Carnegie Mellon. Uh, oh, and, and our, oh. Our, uh, our our thought is that Carnegie Mellon didn't have the foresight to call themselves a college. They called themselves a school. So we claim bragging rights at the moment. Oh, that's good to see. Um, you know, especially to have that uh, that historical root, and yet at the same time being this future oriented, which uh, I think is terrific. Well, you um, know, from my I love I love history, so so I I, I do make these connections. 
Indeed, indeed. In fact, your uh, one of your early one of your first books on education has a great title from uh, Abelard to Apple, which uh, really gives you a sense of sweep of time. Right. Um, well, let's talk about the online master of science in computer science. Um, now, I see it's abbreviated often OMSCS. Um, right. Do you have a shorthand term for that? Do you call it OMSCS or? Uh, no, we don't try to. We don't try to pronounce it, and um, <laughs> you know. This be, this should be an object lesson uh, in never making decisions that might be permanent uh, at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> uh, although we continue to, 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 to do it. It's, it's, uh, it's online masters in, in computer science. Um, we have, we have a, a, I think, a pipeline, and we can talk about this in a few minutes. We, we have a pipeline of, of graduate programs of the same kind, and they all have this OMS, Online Masters of Science, uh, designation to them, and then the, the subject matter areas. I see, I see. So that's the branding becomes an issue, um, as the as do vowels. Um, well, can you tell us a bit about the genesis of this? I mean, what was was your idea to produce a um, to increase access to graduate work in computer science by reducing the price and moving something online so it'll be more accessible, more convenient? Or were you trying to experiment with what an on, a fully online graduate program would look like? Or was this born out of your engagement with the MOOC movement that you've written so well about? Uh, actually, all of those. The, um, the, the, the origin of this, and, and in, um, in my last book, Revolution on, uh, in Higher Education, mm -hmm. I, I, I give a, a more formal account of the history. Um, we were we were very early into um, uh, into experimenting with with MOOCs, and in, in fact, um, George Siemens um, was doing uh, what were those at, at that time um, very large open online courses, fifteen hundred uh -huh. students, two thousand uh, students, and uh, and we were involved in in George's um, courses in two thousand eleven, maybe. Um, and it was it was an interesting thing for us to to, to do, uh, uh, partially because we're a technological university, and this particular convergence of technologies was interesting to us uh, from a technical standpoint. But also because um, we had been thinking for a couple of years by that time um, about disrupted modes of delivery, um, different modes of access, um, what could you attain uh, in in courses delivered in online. Uh, online format, um, and it, it was maybe um, three or four months into the the Siemens course uh, when I got a call from Sebastian Trun, um, who had just come back from his his design conference uh, in Berlin, um, and he said, "I've resigned my my uh, position at Stanford. Um, mm -hmm. I want to offer uh, a massive open online course. Um, we've already signed up 150,000." students. So that was already much, much larger than, than George had in mind, and it got my attention. Uh, and uh, over the course of maybe two months, we, um, we visited uh, not only Sebastian, but Daphne Kohler, uh, who, mm -hmm. was, um, uh, who was starting a parallel, parallel company, um, um, some of the, the Silicon Valley venture capitalists who were, who were funding it. Uh, and um, we had kind of decided, well, we're going to jump into this. We're going to we're going to continue the, the the Siemens experiment, maybe on this larger this larger scale. And uh, uh, I literally got a phone call on on Christmas Eve from um, from the um, at that time provost at MIT, who says, well, we're not only going to do that, we're going to offer credit for it. So so mm -hmm. there were a lot of things in the air uh, in the winter of 2000, uh, 2011. Um, and and we had decided to push forward with converting a substantial portion of our course catalog to be available online anyway. Um, the um, the next three or four months were sort of a blur. Um, Sebastian visited uh, my successor as dean, um, is V. Galil, who had been the dean of engineering at Columbia before he was here. Um, uh, engaged with Sebastian very early on. Um, there was a challenge um, put forward to 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 do an actual degree program 
uh, in this um, in this format. Sebastian suggested that it be for free. Um, B said, no, 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 it's not going to be for free. Um, but we will we will um, try to innovate around the business model for delivery um, of this. And much to our surprise, um, the university allowed us to start with a blank sheet of paper, uh, build up the cost of um, of offering the program. And instead of doing what I have to admit I had advocated for, which is to discount off the off the current tuition, forty five thousand uh dollars -huh. or something like like that, um, to to allow us to start with a blank sheet of paper and build up the cost and and and, and add a contingency on top on top of that um, uh -huh. that would allow us to offer um, the most efficient degree possible, and that's how we came up with the six thousand seven hundred dollar um, degree. Um, but the genesis of it was was to take um, what was already one of the premier graduate experiences in computer science, um, put it into a format that would allow people who weren't able to travel to Atlanta uh, to experience the course uh, in, a, in, a, in a different way, to, to, to get the same, um, the same instructors, the same material, the same assessments, um, and we hope the same um, satisfaction with the, with the educational experience. That's a great backstory, um, especially to have the success come out of a time when many see the MOOC movement as as flailing or not doing well. Um, before I go further, and I have a whole bunch of questions, uh, I just wanted to see everybody else, please, I uh, don't let me hog the floor. You all have interest. You all have questions on this. Some of you may have taken uh, these classes. Some of you may have considered offering some of your own institutions. The floor is open. Uh, and again, using those different commands, you can either click the raised hand to join us up here on stage. Uh, you can use the question mark to ask a question by text. You can ask questions by chat. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we have, uh, it, the conversation gets better with the more and more voices we can involve. Um, Rich, you mentioned uh, some of the partners working with, uh, you know, approaching Daphne Collar and talking to MIT and talking to Sebastian Thrun. Um, but right now, my understanding is that your program is supported by two main partners. Uh, is that Udacity and AT and T? Is that right? Uh, Udacity is our is our, our technology partner. Tech, they're our, uh, our, our platform, platform pro provider. Um, uh, the um, um, the management of the program, I think, is is very nicely split between between the academic and the and the technical um, the technical side. Um, the um, the role of AT and T has been to be the philanthropic donor. Uh, one of the one of the um, deals I made with the university when I set up the center here um, was that that we would do everything possible uh, to not use state resources uh, to fund our, our, our experiments and investments. Um, and so when AT&T when AT um, um, approached us as a, as a potential philanthropic partner, it really fit into this mindset that we had, that we wanted, we wanted broad investment in the idea of graduate education um, in computer science. It would, it would make things um, I, I think um, more sustainable from a business standpoint. If we didn't have to to take the the the, um, um, the investment funds for operating the course and also use them for creating course materials, uh, and it's it's turned out exactly that way. And and the other master programs that we're running, I think, are built on the same basic model, the same the same way of looking at where do we go to get the the content created versus how do we fund the sustainable operational part of the program. Uh, that's a really, really important backstory for this. Uh, and Phil Katz uh, has a question for you who asks the, about the funding matter. And he asks quite plainly, why shouldn't state funds be used at a state university? Uh, well, it, it was at, at the beginning for us, it was an, it was an expedient. Um, hmm. I, I, I had, um, because we, we don't have an education school here at, at Georgia Tech, um, I had the problem of, of, of creating um, a community of practice around educational research um, that, that didn't really that didn't really exist. And it, that would have been difficult to do uh, if I had to take if I had to take from a very limited um, state funding pot that was used 
to, um, um, to renew and sustain existing courses and apply it to these new untested um, areas, which to be honest, some people, me included, um, thought were kind of risky uh, and, um, and, and maybe needed a different kind of a, a partner to, um, to do that. Um, we don't know whether or not that's a model that's going to work for every institution. We don't even know if it's going to be able to work for us um, indefinitely, but, but for now it's been a pretty good model. Good to know. Uh, good question, Phil. And if, if you're new to the forum, this is just how easy it is for people to uh, ask questions. Um, so you have at t for philanthropy, you have Udacity for uh, tech platform support. Um, and then um, within uh, Georgia Tech, let, let, me, let me ask if I could, what's the reception been like over the several years you've been doing this? Uh, what kind of um, support, what kind of pushback, what kind of interest have you gotten from within the uh, university? Uh, the um, the support has been has been surprisingly ro robust. Um, I I don't think that we've had um, the same kinds of um, um, acrimonious debates that I've seen other uh, other places. Uh, I, mm. I I give Dean Galil a lot of credit um, for this. He's a far more patient dean than I was, uh, <laughs> and, and he was he was willing he was willing. Uh, to um, to promise to the computer science faculty um, that it was in their hands in the first place whether or not they wanted mm. uh, to, to do this uh, and then to give them whatever time was needed to um, to make the um, to make the decision that uh, turned out to be not a difficult decision to to make um, there hasn't been a lot of looking back I think among computer science faculty um, if you look across the university uh, at the at the other programs and um, and schools there's there's been I think a wait and see attitude um, there's there's always there's always a, a disagreement I think in a in a, um, a merit-based society like this one uh, as to which direction one should go uh, and we're very conscious of, of of the of the governance mechanisms that have to work their way uh, mm. through uh, but I would say we have, as healthy a pipeline right now in um, in graduate education uh, delivered in this format uh, as any place in the country, maybe any place in the world, uh, and um, and it, it looks it looks like this is going to be uh, for the foreseeable future um, one of the ways that Georgia Tech grows its programs. Wow, well, that's a terrific response. Uh, not just from, not just from you, but also for uh, uh, from from Georgia Tech. Um, I mean, a, a question, a kind of awkward question to ask is that there's the sense that uh, online education is inferior to face-to-face, -face, um, and there's anxiety about it, that if a university offers an online program, will it reduce their reputation? Will it be bad for the brand? Um, what's, what's been your experience with this? Has uh, OMS uh, been a, uh, a problem for Georgia Tech, or has it been a, a just par for your excellent course? Uh, well, it, it's been it's been something that we've um, that we've um, kept our eye on. I think from the from the beginning, from the the early days of of experimenting with with MOOCs, we had decided as a center um, that that we would run um, in parallel with every educational activity that we had an independent research program. So 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 we were determined. To, to take a hard look at pedagogy, to take a, a hard look at what achievement levels were uh, mm -hmm. in these new formats, quantify those as best we, um, we could. Um, I didn't personally think it was a great idea to have to engage in guesswork and speculation uh, about important questions like, like that. So, so we just kind of set that aside and said, we, we are going to understand to the level that we can with the resources that we have available, to what extent are people learning um, uh, equivalently or not equivalently uh, in these in these new formats. Um, how does the experience differ? Uh, can we quantify uh, that? And then and then can we um, can we intentionally implement pedagogical tools um, that would be difficult to do without using um, the technology? So so Daphne's TED talk on on implementing mastery learning, for example, was very much on our mind. Um, you know, my background was um, in computer science research, so the idea of scaling using technology to scale to do something that you really want to do 
was kind of in my bloodstream at the time anyway. Uh, and mm, and that yeah. turned out to be one of the underlying principles for all of our courses. So if you notice that, um, that Georgia Tech courses, for example, are not simply GoPro cameras pointed at the front of a classroom, they are deconstructed online versions of, of existing face-to-face uh, courses that implement um, uh, mastery learning to the extent that we can um, that we can do it. Those kinds of things, I, I think, have allowed us to, to step back and say, well, we, we now understand what people learn um, in these sections. We understand comparatively what they what they what they learn, and we understand the the affective things. So we understand how do they feel about the course. Uh, we we understand what their um, um, what their psychological state is when they when they are in the course as opposed to sitting in a in a classroom. All, all that stuff has been really valuable to us. It sounds like it'd be valuable for everyone to learn about that. Um, before I uh, I pounce that question, I, we have a question from uh, say, Christy Wold McCormick. Uh, let's see if we can flash that on the screen. Um, and Christy, if I've massacred your name, please, please forgive me. I understand Georgia Tech sets up its MOOC programs in a separate campus of record than its main campus programs. Do you prevent students from moving back and forth between MOOCs and the other? Um, I, I, the, the term campus of record isn't one, isn't one that, we, um, that, that we use. The, 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 um, the degree granting programs, the credit, the credit granting programs are in every sense integrated um, with, um, with, the, with the existing programs. We don't have two versions of, of a degree, for example. We don't have two versions of credit for the, um, for the course. Um, as, a, as a practical matter, um, we don't have, we don't have um, back office systems like Banner that allow us to, to move people freely back and forth between, between in-campus uh, on-campus on experiences and, and online um, online experiences. It's not that we don't want to do that. We just don't know how to do that um, at the um, at the moment. Um, but 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 there there is no there is no separation in terms of faculty governance, um, um, grading, um, degree granting, transcripting, de um, degree um, um, notations that would allow one to distinguish between an online student and a Georgia Tech residential student. Wow. So they're quite similar, not really distinct. They, 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 they are as part and parcel of the same, uh, the same program. So, so for, for example, the online masters in computer science is, is a, a degree program that is run by the college of computing, by my successor as, 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 mm -hmm. as Dean, he, chief academic officer for that program, just as he is for all computer science programs. Well, that's really important. Can, can I ask for, for a wholly online program, what do you do in terms of uh, affect and in terms of other strategies to make these students feel at home within the Georgia Tech community? Um, some of it they do for themselves. Uh, I, 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 I've been really, really um, um, surprised at the, at, the, at the speed with which the online communities have built up around the courses, programs, and, 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 and instructors. If you read the Google Plus uh, discussions, which are open to anyone, actually, you can kind of follow these things uh, along. Um, the, the, the students themselves have taken um, uh, a lot of responsibility um, for, um, um, uh, for agency. So, so, so they, they, have, they have decided, for, for example, that, that there are things uh, that, they can, that they can teach each other um, that if they were on campus, they might do in a club, they might do uh, in, right. um, in, a, in a student student lounge. They happen to do it in these online online communities. Um, if I cool. think of an example. So, so, one, so one, one of the early examples was that they figured out very early on um, how to teach each other how to interview uh, for Silicon Valley, um, Plum Silicon Valley jobs at places like, like, like Google. So they run their own boot camps oh. for, for how to uh, how to take what they're learning in the classroom and turn it into uh, career opportunities for them. That was that was one of one of these things that we didn't anticipate, but it in retrospect it was a perfectly natural thing uh, thing to do. Um, we we spent we spent a lot of time um, uh, talking to faculty about the importance of engagement, uh, and and even among skeptical faculty, I think we hear um, over and over again 
the degree with which the faculty feels connected to the students in these large sections uh, is remarkable. Um, um, the, the students, students um, um, feel feel that closeness. I I, um, I think there, there's there's kind of an emotional uh, attachment to the the program, and I, I can get into rationale for that in a few seconds. There's there's an emotional attachment to the the, the program that comes from availability. I, I believe um, when when I visit um, places like I, I spend a lot of time at places like Microsoft Research. Inevitably, I'll be walking down the uh, in some building in, in Redmond, um, and I'll hear off in the distance someone yelling, Professor DeMille, Professor and, and And some young software engineer from, um, from Microsoft will come running up to me and, and introduce herself as a, as a, um, um, a Georgia Tech OMSCS student. And I'm always surprised when they're because, because they're literally 20 minutes away from the University of Washington. They could jump in a car. Mm -hmm. Same, the same master's uh, program, um, but they don't, and and they identify as Georgia Tech students. So, so that emotional tie, I think, is somehow built into into the community and 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 the availability of the of the program. Um, it shows up in a lot of different ways. The students, um, about a third, I think, is is the current number. A third of the students that complete the program uh, actually choose to come. To Atlanta to walk across the state, which seems wow. to me to be um, a really interesting phenomena, given that they've taken all these pains to to do everything long distance, right? Uh, right, and, and now they want this on campus experience of receiving the degree from the president. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, I, I want to return to this, but we, we have a we have a video question, uh, Tara. If you could bring up uh, um, Seth Tiger, who. Um, is probably the best named participant I've seen in months. And he's from Rice. Hello, Seth. Hi there. Hi, uh, hi, hi Brian. Seth. Hi, Rich. Thanks for uh, thanks for having us today. Welcome. Um, so I just kind of wanted to ask you. We're kind of touching about um, the intimacy that uh, your program has has um, uh, created, and I just kind of wanted to touch more on that and. Uh, how do you recreate a sense of on one on one intimacy or or more of a tutoring type of experience that um, is often seen in CS programs in an online realm, either uh, stylistically through your video lectures or other course elements? I think so. I think I missed most of that question. Oh, no. oh I'm sorry. Uh, no, sorry. Well, so, so Seth's question sure. is about how do you? How do you recreate the intimacy that is uh, so powerful in computer science classes face to face, especially in the uh, uh, tutoring mode? Uh, how do you recreate that face to face uh, intimacy uh, and pedagogical effectiveness online? Um, it's it's a bit cobbled together. I, I, I think is the is the right the right answer. Um, uh, at 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 some level, um, we're dependent on faculty engagement, and 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 what we what we hear. Um, from faculty is is that um, to their surprise, um, they know um, as much or more about the students in the in the OMSCS classes than they do students sitting in the third row of a classroom on Georgia Tech campus. Mm. Um, mm. And I think some of that is because because you know these are people that 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 are are used to to. Um, um, to digital communication, so so a right. one a.m. email uh, is a perfectly natural thing uh, for them to do. To get an immediate response back from an instructor at one a.m. Uh, is is probably unusual um, for them, but but it, it does establish this this connection. So I, I've got a, um, a series of emails from uh, what I call my skeptical uh, faculty members uh, who who thought that it would be a very impersonal experience. And and, mm -hmm. and yet, mm -hmm. they they can say, look, I I, I know that 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 so and so uh, is um, um, is um, um, is um, uh, you know a Cambodian student who happens to be female, um, but I only know that because because she told me, um, not because she's sitting there in 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 the, the front row of, of of class. But I know a lot more about this person. Than I do the person sitting in that third row of um, of class. Um, 
Um, we, we, we also, we also I, I think, put a lot of energy into innovating um, in ways that, that draw students into the, into the process. Uh, when we first um, looked at the, at the course assignments for um, uh, an engineering course, um, you know, we were, we were looking to see what is, what is the, what is the capstone project for the course that the student would present if they were sitting in a classroom? And it would be, you know, maybe a 30 slide PowerPoint um, uh, presentation. Um, and, and you have to step back from that and say, well, is that the assessment tool that in 2017, 2018, you would put in place in order to, 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 um, uh, to teach people software engineering? And, and the answer was no. Uh, you would do something much more interactive, much more uh, rich in the use of, of, of media like like videos. Um, and so, so, so once you once you make this transition, that the way that you did things probably needed to be uh, re-engineered anyway. Why not do it in a way that makes it easier for people to um, to to interact? Um, and I don't know where we are, um, Seth, along that, that that journey, but 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 every step along the way. We're sort of taking a look at what is it that we want to do with this kind of with this kind of assessment, with this kind of report, this kind of interaction, and how can we make it a richer experience? Excellent. Well, thank you. Appreciate your response. Oh, great uh, question. Tell the Sarkar. Seth said hi if you see him on campus. Will do. There's right. that virtual virtual friendship, and virtual connection right there. Um, thank you, Seth. Thank you. Uh, we have a few more questions in the pipeline uh, coming in, uh, and let me just ask you if um, if you're in a spot where uh, you can uh, show your smiling face, uh, please turn your camera on um, so we can see you. Um, and if you can't, we completely understand. Um, Tara, why don't you bring up the next question in the queue? This is from Steve Terry. Uh, he says, Rich, given the rapid change in teaching and learning, I read this summer you mentioned it's hard to know how these changes plan out beyond a 10 planning cycle. Can you say more? I think Steve meant a 10 year planning cycle. I'm not sure. 10 year, yeah, 10 year planning cycle. We, we've, um, we've struggled with, with, with that. Uh, the, um, struggled in a good way. I, 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 I think the, um, the, the amount of time that it takes, um, to, um, to, to get some sort of consensus around a fundamental change, uh, is nowhere near as long as we thought it was uh, it was going to be. So when we started, for example, uh, planning for for, for MOOC delivery, uh, I really thought it was a ten year process before we would have a substantial portion of our course catalog uh, in this in this format. Um, it turned out to be much shorter um, than that, um, and and we kind of ran at high speed to um, to to keep keep up. Um, but but things that we thought were were, were 10 years out turned out to be less than five years uh, hmm. out. The, 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 hmm. number, the number of graduate programs, um, I, I, I think, is, is a good metric for us, for us here. I, I think that Georgia Tech has, uh, as of today, expanded its, um, its overall enrollment by 30% in the last four years. Um, virtually, oh. all of that, virtually all of that due to, uh, to the online graduate programs. Which is, is that is that just in graduate programs or graduate plus undergraduate? Uh, we we when we started this process, we were we were about twenty five thousand students. Um, we are today thirty two thousand, something like 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 that. Wow. That's, that's, that's the entire. That's, that's, that's the, the entire graduate population. plus population. Graduate plus undergraduate, yeah. And that that excludes that excludes the continuing education component, which is another thirty thousand. People. That's that's an existing that's an existing line of business that that, that that continues to grow. So this this is in in the bread and butter, the core part of the of the of the university. Wow. Well, along along those lines, we had a, a, qu a question from Stanford. I'm sorry, it's from Daniel Stanford, who wanted to build on Sebastian, uh, who asked, "How large is a typical class?" Uh, um, it, it varies. It varies from from um, from subfield to, to, to subfield. Um, a large class for us um, is probably, if you think in terms of, of equivalent sections, um, cool. it's probably a hundred person section um, of, a, of a class. It's it's not it's not a hard and fast rule. Uh, we don't we don't actually um, cap um, 
cap section sizes. Um, but but I, I think if you, if you look across our, our, our portfolio, the biggest sections are probably in the 800 to 900 student range. So that's that's bigger than a normal grad school class, but smaller than a MOOC. Sort of like Harvard CS fifty. Oh, okay, that that was a, that sounds like some, something you you had in mind. Um, yeah. Good question, Daniel. Um, and if, if Daniel, if you want to follow up with more, please. I understand if you uh, uh, can't do audio visual, just keep you know keep the text coming. Uh, Tara, we had another question. Uh, I think in the queue. Um, uh, I think a text question or a video question. Why don't you flash that up? Uh, this is for Anne Marie Healy, who says on the Georgia Tech website, women and underrepresented minorities are registered at 14.8 or 14.9% with an online degree. Are there initiatives to engage more students in those categories? Uh, yes. Uh, part, of, part of the issue that's being discussed here, I think, is, um, is unique to computer science. Computer science in recent years has struggled um, to um, um, to um, to uh, to attract more women to the um, to the field, um, I, there there are a lot of reasons that, and, and, and maybe we should we should have a separate conversation about this at, at some point. There, there there are a lot of reasons um, that people believe that that, that CS has been um, has been kind of down this pathway that that is not good from a diversity standpoint. Um, and we inherit that. We inherit that in the in the residential program, and we inherit it in the um, in the on, online program. Um, it, it's not it's not clear um, to us that that in in some of the other online um, degrees that we're going to have the same the same numbers. For example, uh, we have an online um, master's in analytics uh, that looks much more gender um, gender e equitable uh, and. Really? I, uh, I don't have I don't have the numbers at my at my fingertips, but it's it, the, the the number of females in, in enrolled is much higher than um, than in um, in computer science. Um, but but we've been down this path before at Georgia Tech, and and, and part of part of what we did um, in the early two thousands to um, to get some balance to restore some 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 balance um, uh, in in undergraduate computer science. Um, was, was deconstruct the undergraduate program. So, so, so to, to deliberately pull the program apart and put it back together um, to offer, for example, career pathways that 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 high school girls coming to Georgia Tech they would find more attractive uh, in in pursuing career paths, uh, and and that had a, that had a dramatic effect on our uh, on our, on our female enrollment. We haven't we haven't done that for the graduate um, program yet. Um, graduate students present a little different challenge because they're kind of mid career. Um, they're young professionals yeah. that are they're going from point A to point B, and it's not clear that we would use the same mechanisms that would work on an eighteen year old high school high school graduate. Um, but we're very much aware of this. I, I think around the country, computer scientists are very much aware of this uh, of, of this issue. Uh, and um, I, I, I think it's probably too soon to tell whether or not the online component hurts or helps that. Um, although I, I will say anecdotally that, that the more geographies that we push into with this program, um, the, the, the less and less the student profiles look like American uh, student, student profiles. And so you find in Latin America, for example, many, many more women enrolled in the program than in the U.S. Whoa. And when you say geographies, you mean global, not just within the U.S. Global, global, global geographies, yeah. Wow, wow, that's fascinating, fascinating. That's one of the promises of MOOCs, in many ways, to be so transnational. Uh, right. Uh, we have a um, Steve Ehrman had a question about this, um, and he uh, he asked me this a couple of days ago, uh, along these lines, uh, and I just wanted to uh, um, bring this up. He asks. Um, you know, the, one of the ways to characterize um, graduate programs is to what extent they reduce or increase achievement gaps among different groups of categories, different categories of students, especially groups that haven't been well served in the past. You know, thinking from we've mentioned gender right now, but also thinking about first generation students, racial minorities, uh, the disabled, right. Um, right. And, and and you know. So Steve wanted to know what's your sense about uh, how uh, the OMS program is reducing such gaps. 
You, know, you, you spoke to um, the gender. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, it, it's a it's a great crest question, uh, Stephen Bryan, and and um, I I think we need a lot more eyeballs on 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 this. Um, mm -hmm. our, our focus has been um, on um, what we later discovered was a market expansion, uh, and and so when we when, when we look at where the penetration uh, has been greatest for OMSCS students. Uh, it's been in what we didn't recognize before, but now recognize as an underserved, maybe an unserved uh, market for quality graduate education uh, in computer science. And it's, it, it is in mid-career uh, mid professionals. Uh, so if you, if you start out with that as a market segment, you don't have a lot of control um, over who's in that segment. You have to, you have to take the population as it's, um, as it's given. Um, the, 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 the first big bump that we saw, for example, uh, in, um, in enrollment in 2013 um, turned out to be, uh, well, there's a big bump in Georgia, but, 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 but the, outside Georgia, the biggest bump was uh, in Central Valley of California. Um, and, and the reason is uh, that a lot of U.S. manufacturing in information technology still occurs around Sacramento and that, that north-south region. Uh, in California, um, those were all engineers that used to work for me at Hewlett Packard, and 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 hmm. uh, I know I know a lot of those people by name. I know that they have families and um, and mortgages, and, um, and in some cases, college tuition for their kids. Um, it's simply not possible for them to pick up stakes uh, and move to two year, for two years to Berkeley to pursue an undergraduate an undergraduate degree. Um, so those were the people that rushed in initially, and I, I think they still form the largest single cohort um, of registrants for the um, for the program. Um, once you beyond that group, then then, then I, I think you, you can ask the questions about so how do we how do we look at at the next group of unserved underserved um, um, uh, people that that would benefit from this program. Uh, and ask the same questions over over and over again. But um, you know, we're we're right now trying to understand the market expansion aspect of it. Well, that's an unusual thing to hear from somebody leading uh, enterprise in American higher education. The word expansion doesn't normally come up, uh, so that's a great thing for you to be able to say. Well, jo uh, Josh Goodman, who's our who's our um, uh, our shadow at at Harvard Kennedy School. Um, has been has been following this program from the from the beginning. Um, his estimate is is that um, the OMSCS program by itself uh, has expanded the market in graduate education in computer science by fifteen percent a year. Whoa! I mean, the total market, not just your share of it, but that you you've grown the entire pie by fifteen percent. Wow! Oh, that's tremendous. Well, on that note, let me let me bring in another one of your compadres from Georgia Tech. We have uh, Rob. Is it Rob Cadle? Hey, Rob. Hey, Brian. Hey, Rich. Um, so here's a question uh, that, uh, since I work for Rich, might seem like a softball question, but I, I promise you it's one that he and I have not discussed before. Um, what is the most important uh, thing that you've learned about creating large-scale online degree programs that you wish you had known when creating the OMSCS? Um, I, I, I have to admit that, that my motives at the outset were, were, were somewhat impure. Uh, uh, I, 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 for, for many, many months um, during course, during program creation, business plan development, and, and, and all of this, um, my mindset was was that this was a purely competitive play um, that would um, that would advantage us versus um, a place like Duke or, 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 or Vanderbilt, and and I really I really believed um, that that graduate education at a place like Georgia Tech uh, was preparatory for something um, something else, maybe a PhD, maybe um, maybe a more um, uh, a less product-oriented uh, career career path, which turned out not to be the case. Uh, I, 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 it simply didn't occur to me to 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 look at who was most likely to benefit 
uh, from these programs and to do a rough count of the numbers of people that that would turn out to, to be. Um, I think had we done that uh, uh, initially, um, we probably would have spent um, more of our resources up front uh, in, in, in building scaling tools into the, uh, into the system to begin with. And, and I don't think that's, it's disadvantaged us a lot in, in, in the process, but it might, it might've accelerated some of the changes that we, we want to make in the program. Um, now we, we are currently bumping up against, I think some, some, some hard business limits that we have to, um, that we have to invent our way, way out of, and we probably would have addressed those earlier on. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate it. Good question, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, Rich, this is a program focused on the future of education technology. And I, I think it's pretty clear that you have in your practice described now uh, one way forward for um, higher education. Let me ask if you could, uh, what do you see this program becoming over the next five or 10 years? And do you see more versions of it cropping up at other institutions? Um, the, the, the answer to the second question is yes. Um, we just saw a raft of announcements from edX uh, two weeks ago uh, of, of $10,000 um, uh, masters and, and, and mini masters degrees uh, basically focused on the same market that, that, that we're looking at. Um, so we don't know how crowded that market will become, um, but, but it's, it's already brought in uh, uh, the next round of participants. I think to the benefit of everyone, every, everyone involved, Texas, um, I, I, I think has a sub 10,000, I think it's the University of Texas at Austin has now announced a sub $10,000 masters uh, mm. in, in science. So basically comparable from a price standpoint uh, with, with, with ours, one of the best programs in the country, distinguished faculty, a terrific, uh, a terrific brand. Uh, and, and, and I think that's going to make, make the, the, graduate education scene in computer science much more interesting and much uh, and much richer. Um, we're, we're sort of focused on, uh, um, uh, you know, we talked a few minutes ago about, about the inadequacy of a 10 year plan. We're focused on 20 years. Um, and, and so when we look out, um, we, we're, we're now looking out at this 20, 20 year window um, and trying to imagine the convergence of technologies that are gonna, that are gonna fundamentally transform the, the way, not that delivery works, but, but, but the way that education is perceived and, and, and used around the world. Um, cool. And, and, cool. and one, of the things, one of the things that, that we keep coming back to is, is the importance of, um, uh, of human contact and human beings, even in, even in this, this online world. Um, right. I told you the story of visiting Microsoft Research and interacting with people. Every time, every time we send uh, a group of OMSCS faculty to a venue for meetups anywhere, anywhere in the in the world. Um, uh, people will get in their cars, jump on trains, travel for two hours to come and 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 meet with with not only the faculty members who are there from Georgia Tech, but their peers who they often own only Google Plus uh, and online online discussion forums. Um, we're, we're, we're spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to scale that experience, that in-person personal it, it, it experience uh, for, for the size of the programs that we're, that we're talking about. Um, one of our colleagues, Steve Harmon here um, in, the, in the center, um, took a map one day and, uh, and drew two hour driving circles uh, around 10 metro areas in the US. And, and, and once he had done that, he showed us the map and he said that covers 80% of the OMSCS students. Um, so, so you can, you, you can, you can imagine a more retail like presence, um, not a campus, not, not, a, not, not a faculty, um, but a, a way of interacting with people face to face through, through, um, um, through, um, a space of some kind, a physical space, um, that, that would, that would capture, um, most of the students uh, in our uh, in our, our program, and because we're in, um, I think Brittany is, is is online. She can probably tell me how many countries. Um, Ninety nine countries. 
We're in 99 wow. countries. Um, um, be, because we, we know a lot about these, the, these countries, we kind of have an idea of what it would take to project our presence there. We just published a report um, called Deliberate Innovation Lifetime Education um, that, that tries to project out this, this future. And, and one of the ideas that we have uh, is that just like the existing buildings on our campus are designed around an atrium, you know, a mm -hmm. free form space, gathering space, a piazza, a place, a place for students and faculty and scholars and discussions to, to happen with, without a lot of architecture surrounding it. We think that the metaphor of the atrium makes sense for the university of the, of the, of the future. It's the, it's the space, it's the people that are important. It's what you know about the people that are there uh, that's, mm -hmm. that, that, that's important. And, and we probably don't know an awful lot more beyond that at this point, but it's, it's, it's very much on our minds that, that, that there has to be something more than this rapidly commoditizing delivery of information that we think we have a handle on now that, that gets us to the next step of education. Hmm. What a fascinating vision. I mean, I wonder if you would do this, that kind of physical presence through uh, light offices or uh, perhaps maker spaces or through uh, alumni. Um, Rich, we, we have, there's so, so many, so many possibilities for that going ahead. And, and unfortunately we're out of time. Our, our hour has just raced by um, and people have even more questions. Um, let me, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing your thoughts and your experience from this terrific program. And then the second, let me ask, what's the best way for people to keep up both with your program and with yourself? Uh, well, you can you can visit the um, the the C twenty one U website at Georgia Tech. Uh, it's uh, it's www.c21u.jatech.edu. Um, we have a podcast um, that's that's coming online uh, in in a few weeks. The title of the podcast will be um, Engineering Education. It's a it's a play on words. Um, we we do engineering uh, education in the in the business of, of reengineering education. Uh, and um, uh, we encourage people to come to, come to our website, register for the for the website. We'll we'll send you newsletters and, and keep you up to date on what's on what's going on. And we're always um, we're always interested in, in in new friends and visitors. And um, um, just keep us in mind if you're ask, asking questions about the future of higher education. Well, and some of us will keep doing that. Uh, uh, yeah. Tara reminds me that uh, if you look at the bottom, at this whole screen, on the uh, bottom left-hand side, you'll see three different widgets, a kind of tan color, and uh, the top of them is about the OMSCS uh, link, so you can get that. Um, thank you again, Rich. This is, this is terrific stuff, um, and I'm looking forward to uh, bringing you back in a year to learn more about where this is going and where you see the future of education coming. Happy to do it. Um, friends, but don't go away, everybody, because we have uh, just want to show you what we're up to over the next week, and we have a lot of exciting developments. Um, and uh, while we're bringing that up, let me just thank everybody for some terrific, deep questions, uh, wonderful stuff, including from Georgia Tech's own campus. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to be in Denver, Colorado. Uh, we're going to be live at the Educause Conference. So with a world of 6,000 people and a tremendous amount of campuses and vendors, we're going to be there. And the center of our forum is going to be a discussion between myself and Michael Johnson. Uh, Michael is a fantastic consultant, a fantastic creator, just a really, really exciting person. Uh, we're going to be having a discussion, which was initially called Between Two Beards, but we ended up rebranding it as The Pragmatist and the Futurist. Uh, so that's going to be live. You'll be able to interact with that as well as with all the people who are there on site in the room. Um, we're really looking forward to that. Now, if that's not enough for you, uh, we're also uh, launching our book club's current reading, uh, our new reading, which is the wonderfully titled Twitter and Tear Gas, uh, which is a great book by uh, Zainab Tutechki about what happens with social media, mobile devices, and online protest. Definitely a book for a moment. We uh, have a book picked out. We're going to launch the uh, uh, schedule for it in just a couple of days. But please grab a copy however you like. And one way to grab a copy is actually from our online bookstore. So if you just go to brianalexander.org slash bookstore, you can find the only curated bookstore for books about the future of education and technology. Now, between the book club, the books, and next week's session, if you'd like to keep all these conversations going, we're active on social media. 
You can find me as well as the Shindig team available on Twitter. You can also find groups on Slack, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Ping me if you have any questions. In the meantime, love to hear more from you. Thank you for your contributions today. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.